I know I told my students I was canceling a class I have today just so that they could come to this talk, but they knew it was because it's Friday the 13th and I was nervous about being in class with them. <laughs> um, thank you for coming today. Uh, our, our talk is uh, a presentation in the Phi Beta Kappa Visiting Scholars Program. Uh, my name is Doug Norton. I'm secretary of the Villanova chapter of Phi Beta Kappa. Um, Phi Beta Kappa, if you're not a, a, a aware of that, is the oldest and probably the most prestigious academic honor society in the United States, founded in 1776, long known for, um, for recognizing um, excellence in the, in the liberal arts and sciences, not so much in public speaking, as you can tell, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I had this script ready, and I'm sort of improvising as I go. Well, what you may not be aware of is that it also is a strong advocate in lots of public discourse about the, the value of the liberal arts and sciences uh, in culture, which is taking a little bit of a hit these days. And, uh, what can I get a job with this education for? When we argue that a well-trained liberal arts uh, person is, has the flexibility to find lots of different paths once they walk out this door. Another thing that Phi Beta Kappa does with that dedication to the liberal arts and sciences is tries to, tries to bring a special experience of some of the very best thinkers in the country to the campuses. And so the Visiting Scholar Program has been around since 1956. In the years since then, there have been over 600 uh, visiting scholars who've made over 5,000 appearances at colleges and universities across the United States. In each case, the visiting scholar spends a couple of days on campus interacting with the campus community, with the students, and with other constituencies to be able to share some of their intellectual rigor and excitement and uh, adventure of uh, this whole um, intellectual enterprise. So we're delighted to have uh, Professor William Arms to visit with us yesterday. Today, we had a wonderful public lecture uh, last night. Professor Arms is an Emeritus Professor of Computing and Information Sciences at Cornell University. And as we learned in his talk yesterday about some of the history of academic computing, was at Dartmouth and Carnegie Mellon when some very key times in the development of computers in general and academic computing in particular took place over the last, uh, last few decades. Very interesting talk yesterday, and I'll take a more specific uh, attack today in talking about uh, academic libraries in the, in the digital age. Um, and of course, as we know, that seems like the sort of science geeky end of the spectrum, but those of you who are know and love libraries know that that's a special role for everybody in the academic enterprise, and the, and the digital footprint is everywhere, uh, from uh, special sessions on, on pulp fiction that we've had uh, at this, uh, at this uh, college, um, to the more technical end of things, um, to the Augustinian archives, the very specialist collections, and those all have the digital implications. Um, so, uh, also in the audience today, we have uh, Joe Lucia, who's the former director of Falvey Library and will be and is now dean of libraries or some highfalutin sort of title at Temple <laughs> downtown, but is back to be a uh, discussant in some way or other uh, in response to or in the middle of this talk. We'll see how it plays out, but stay tuned to see how that goes. Uh, thank you for coming today, and again, the talk will be on, as you see, Academic Libraries in the Digital Age. Professor Arms. Well, after that very interesting introduction, shall we move straight on to the discussion? Or, uh, this picture here is the new library at Middlebury College in Vermont, where my son actually went to school. Um, to build a new building, expensive building like that, in the center of your campus is a bold undertaking at this time, because there's so many changes going on. I gather Temple is taking the same risk. Um, is it going to prove that places like um, Middlebury or, um, or, or Temple are, are proving wise in putting their resources into these new buildings, or will it turn out to be foolish? Nobody knows the answer to this question. I'm glad they're doing it, but let's at least look at some of the trends and see what the challenges are and how people are responding. First of all, a little bit of nostalgia. Let's go back to the days before computers and um, before we had digital text. This is Balliol College Library, where I was an undergraduate several years ago. Um, and and it, you know, it's one of 40 college libraries a part of the Oxford system, um, noted for its tremendous collection of medieval books, which as a mathematician I didn't make much use of. Um, but if I thought about libraries at all in those days, I just had this general idea that universities had libraries, and great universities had great libraries, and the two just went together. You couldn't have one without the other, okay? And if I'd thought a bit more, and I didn't think about libraries, I just took them for granted, my first thought about libraries would be collections, collections of books and maps and manuscripts and photographs and things like that. 
and buildings. For some reason, the nicest and the most expensive and most imposing buildings on the centre of campuses seemed to be libraries. And then in those libraries, there were people who were called librarians and they, they did something. They sort of selected and organised and catalogued the collections. And some of them actually referenced librarians, actually provided assistance to the people who worked in libraries. But basically they were just there. This, this was part of the university. Later I discovered that libraries had been very early users of technology, but they used the technology to s manage the collections and provide access to them, but the technology was definitely servant to the traditional ways of doing things. As an aside, when visiting the National Library of Brazil, they told me at one time that they had been, that the second typewriter ever in Brazil had been used by the National Library. And this is an example of early adoption of technology. The example I'm going to use, however, is one that was familiar to any of you who are um, familiar with, uh, who are librarians, um, and that is the technology that libraries have used to find things, to access collections. And the first example is the catalogue. Um, a catalogue, as um, you well know, typically has a short record um, for every book and a major item in the collection and as you can see in this slide sort of summary description of the uh, of the items and in the early days and before computing they were typically written handwritten typed or printed on these small cards and held in catalog drawers. Um, the history of uh, library catalogues I think is quite interesting like so many things it goes back to the late 19th century here are three of the major people, Panizzi at the British Museum Library, uh, Cutter um, in Boston, and Dewey who started at um, Amherst College. And steadily the idea of a catalogue moved from a bibliographic thing to something that was used to find things, and then uh, Dewey and others introduced the ideas of classification. I want to talk about the technology of catalogues. Um, cataloguing is expensive. It's skilled people have got to pick up the item and extract information, metadata, about the item and um, make sure that it's the right metadata that is correct and so forth. And very early on, the Library of Congress, the American National Library, um, started a card distribution service. Rather than each library creating their own catalog records, you could buy the cards from the Library of Congress. Notice the date, uh, uh, 1901, and it, it required an act of Congress, okay? Um, if you're distributing these things that many people are going to use, you need standards. The Anglo-American cataloging rules are a wonderful example of a technical standard. I actually use the, um, the AACR um, specification in my software engineering classes as an example of a very well written technical standard. I don't use the 1908 version, I, use the, I think I use the 67 version. Um, some people think it's, they've actually got less clear and precise over the years, but I won't comment on that. Um, in the early days of computing, notice that date, 1965, the Library of Congress, um, led by Henriette Avram, um, started exchanging their catalogue records not by sending out printed records, but by exchanging them on magnetic tape. And they created a format, the MARC format, which was way in advance of the um, formats used by the commercial computing at the time. They had some really strange modern ideas, the idea that you could have up and lower case letters, that you could have letters from character sets other than 26 letters of our alphabet, okay, that that you could actually have variable length fields. You didn't have to have everything 80 characters long. Um, I'm not joking. These were breakthroughs in the history of computing. Um, shortly afterwards, Fred Kilgore in Ohio um, put up one of the very first um, na nationwide distributed transaction-based systems called OCLC for sharing catalog records. The basic idea was 
load all the catalog records from the Library of Congress and other places and libraries connected. Um, very early computing technology. OCLC had to invent networks. They didn't have a network. They had to build their own network. They had to build a special terminal, special databases. Um, and finally on this slide, once you've got these records on computer, um, in the early 1980s, people started putting them on local computers. So instead of using those card catalogs, people could access them by computer terminals. The reason I want to stress these things is these were really advanced computing. Okay, The library computing community was really ahead um, of other people in managing text and providing access to these materials. The other example I want to use for this and the, is indexing and abstracting. For people like me, for scientists, um, I'm much less interested in the bibliographic information about a, 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 a book or, or a other material uh, than content. Medicine, the National Library of Medicine has been a leader and the typical thing that a medical um, practitioner or researcher wants is they want to know something about a topic. What articles have been published on cardiac arrest or uh, something like that. And in the late 19th century, about the same time, they started publishing monthly index medicus with a um, short record of the content of each journal article. So it has an abstract and subject headings and they created a medical thesaurus. In the 1964, um, once again very early in the history of computing, they moved to producing index medicus on magnetic tape and having the magnetic tape some bright person and I don't know who it was recognized that you could actually search these things so everybody who had a query would write the query in a complex um, um, format and once a day they would read all the magnetic tapes and all the queries and print out a list of all the journal articles that matched the query and um, primitive but a real breakthrough and very early Quite soon afterwards, once again, early in the history of computing, they put this um, information online so that remote libraries could reach in and make use of these, do these queries. I skip about 25 years of development to the early days of the web, but very early in the existence of the web, they put, a, put up an online system, PubMed, um, with web-based searching designed not for skilled reference librarians but for end users and there's a huge amount of detail left out of this but the key thing is consistently the National Library of Medicine was right at the forefront of technology libraries were, technolo were technical leaders okay now let's skip to the 1990s I think of the 1990s as a, as a formative period um, Early digital libraries. Um, this, by the way, is a screenshot um, a, or a collage of the uh, Library of Congress's American Memory Project from about that time. Why this period was important was computing technology and computing costs had reached a stage that one could seriously consider putting large collections of text or digitized images or or Im scanned images of existing materials online. All the things before then, with a few exceptions, had been metadata. Small amounts of text that described the, the, the library items, but the library items were physical artifacts like books and journals and maps and, and so forth. Okay, and so here are the advances in computing, cheap storage, networks, the, inter the internet, and personal computers um, for the users. There was also very important that some general purpose software became available, um, search software and web browsers, so people um, like libraries, building systems, didn't have to do all the user interfaces. And this led to a flurry of research and development um, and new initiatives. And I'm going to divide them into two parts. I'm going to talk a bit the, about the new directions that libraries and publishers took in the 1990s. And I'm going to talk about things that took place outside the libraries, things that by scientists and scholars and professionals who did, their, who did things in parallel to and differently from the libraries. 
So first of all, what did the libraries do? First of all, digital collections. There were a couple of very early examples of, of disciplines that got their core literature digitized in, and, uh, 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 on, uh, uh, and online. And it's funny enough, they were law and classics. You might say, what do law and classics have in common? Um, well, they actually have something very interesting in common, that their core literature is very small. So um, Lexis, developed by Jerry Rubin, who I had the chance to work with quite a bit in later years, um, um, a lawyer, by the way, a, a, new, law, a new York lawyer, uh, okay, um, developed and got online large portions of United States law in the early 1970s. Uh, about the same time, the classicists began a program um, to get all of classical Greek online. There's not much classical Greek, okay? And therefore, it's the, the restrictions in computing were not such a burden. Steve Waite at, at Dartmouth was one of the early people there. One of my sins was to cut off his funding at one stage. But, you know, not every decision you make turns out to be a good one. But actually, but he actually managed to get um, the Packard Foundation funded an awful lot of this work. Okay. It, in the 1990s, however, a lot of digitization projects took place, and um, these projects were typically of the form of scanning existing materials. Um, for reasons that I'm sure you, many of you understand, the emphasis was on historic materials that are out of copyright, um, but that's a digression I won't go into. Two early projects were at the University of Michigan and um, and at Cornell University, the Making of America project. The Cornell work was, by the way, led by Anne Kenny, who is now the Cornell University librarian, and it was the, when she first came into prominence. The American memory at the Library of Congress um, is perhaps the best known of these projects. My wife has worked at the Library of Congress for a long time. It's a stodgy, slow-moving, <laughs> badly managed, um, wonderful institution. Uh, its collections are phenomenal, and in a funny sort of plodding way, it's actually covered a lot of ground over the years. More recently, we've seen the mass book digitization projects. They haven't had a full impact yet, for, and copyright is one of the major reasons, but I, I can't help thinking that in the long term, this may be the most important thing that's going on in libraries today. Um, the Hattie Trust, um, organized by the University of Michigan is, is doing grand work in trying to coordinate and make these things available. However, the most important thing that took place in, in the 1990s was with journals, okay? Journals um, went, in a relatively short space of time, the, almost all the mainstream journals went from being paper-based, um, coming out in monthly or periodic um, um, bound uh, volumes to being digitized and online. Now, I, I'm hesitant to um, show you a website from Elsevier um, <laughs> Publishing because their business practices and the business practices of some of the other um, uh, commercial publishers are an absolute disgrace. But what they did technically during the 1990s was very impressive. Um, and um, what they and other people did was fundamentally they moved from a paper-based publishing model to a computer-based model. Um, they also went back and digitized large portions of the old journals. So the new thing is, instead of libraries having journals on shelves, the journals are stored on remote servers um, <coughs> with access over the internet. And the libraries, and it, or individuals in some cases, if you belong to a society, like the IEEE, you can subscribe to their journals. And um, it's a subscription to a, a, a central service model. Um, libraries also have the strange um, role in this of restricting access to the publications um, so that people who, who are not members of, say, Villanova don't have access to them. The important thing about this is that many scientists and scholars do not need to visit the library. I can't remember when last I visited a library to read a journal, okay? In fact, I can't remember when last I visited a library to read anything in the collections. Essentially, everything I need is available online. 
And if I, it's not online, I'm more likely to send an email to the author and say, please send it to me, than I am to walk, you know, 100 yards to a library. And anyway, so these are some of the things that libraries and publishers did during the 1990s. I now want to look at the things um, that other people did, and I'm calling this beyond the traditional library. For example, many of you don't think of this as a library, but actually this may be more important to the academic activities of many of us than, than our traditional library. This is a, a Google machine room, okay? And what it is, is a lot of computers, and they have a lot of these things. So, what, are, what, what were these things beyond the traditional library? Uh, and here are a few, and I'm going to give you examples of each of them. First of all, bypassing the traditional publishers, and often bypassing the traditional libraries, in, in making academic, scholarly, and related materials available. Okay? Secondly, the discovery um, the communities of volunteers could often generate high quality metadata or information about things at least as well, if not better, than expensive, highly skilled, highly trained librarians, professors, um, indexing professionals, um, and so forth. Um, the next one is really interesting, and that is if you have huge amounts of computing power, you can sometimes do with very simple algorithms things that we think of as needing skilled individuals, but sometimes we can do things really well that way. And if you have huge amounts of computing power and vast amounts of data and really advanced algorithms, it's incredible what you can do. Okay? So this statement down the, the um, the bottom here, huge amounts of computer power, simple algorithms, often outperform human intelligence in organizing and finding information. Let me give you some examples of all of these. First of all, direct publishing. Um, examples of direct publishing is when I write a paper and I put it on my website, okay? There's a preprint out there. People who want to read it can read it, okay? Um, so personal or departmental websites, preprints, all that sort of semi-published literature. A lot of published material is put online. Um, reports, government documents. Um, I had a, one of those slightly scary moments when a few years back, it would be actually be about 10 years back, there was a National Research Council report that I'm really looking forward to see. And it so happened that almost simultaneously I received the PDF version um, over by email and a bound version in a nice glossy thing. And I just flipped the bound version into my waste paper basket. The recycling bin, you'll be glad to know, but the, the fact was it was of no interest to me. I want, the PDF version was what I was going to store on my computer and that was how I was going to read it. Okay? New types of journals and other sorts of serials. One thing that I was involved with, which some of you may know, was a little online magazine called DLib magazine, which we brought out as part of a research project in 1995 and has continued ever since. And then many maps, folk to archives, etc. And the, the thing about all of these things is they tend to be direct publishing, bypassing traditional publishers and libraries. Um, perhaps the most interesting of all um, from the point of view of um, a, a academic life is the work of Paul Ginsberg initially at um, Los Alamos National Labs, who in the 1990s um, basically contacted his colleagues in high performance computing and said, send the preprints of your papers to me and I will put them up on the web. Actually, he started before the web, but he was an early web adopter. And this has become the standard way to, put, to, to distribute research um, articles in physics and related disciplines. You send your, your, um, your articles to the archive, as it's called, and 4 p.m. every day they release all the papers for, the, for that discipline. You, they may, you may then send a message to the American Physical Society or even to Elsevier saying, my article is online and please review it and publish it in your journals. 
But the working physicists read these things on the website and, um, and discuss them and that sort of stuff. You may notice this says Cornell University Library. And yet this is in part of the talk which is about outside the library, beyond the library. When we recruited Paul to Cornell about a dozen years ago, part of the bargain was that he, the library would continue looking after um, th this, this service. And that's a very important thing. Um, for one thing, they had better graphic designers than he ever was. Um, next thing, communities of volunteers with no formal training. I remember one time um, talking to Paul. It's actually at a party at our house, I think. And I asked him a mathematical question. Paul is a, Paul Ginsburg is a very fine mathematician. The question um, which mathematicians will recognize is what is the difference between a Hilbert space and a Banach space? Now, you may know this instinctively, but most of us faced with such a question, we look, at, look it up, OK? Paul immediately went to the nearest computer and looked it up in Wikipedia, OK? Wikipedia is developed entirely by community, so forth. This example is from quantum mechanics. Um, but in many, many areas, the quality of the, the, the accuracy of the material and the quality of the descriptions in Wikipedia far superior to any textbook or any standard thing. Um, the fact is that if I want to look up anything in mathematics and it's there in Wikipedia, I have a great deal of confidence that it's, it's right. Communities of volunteers with no formal training. Now let's start off with the first example of using Im in immense computing power with sim simple algorithms. Do, do any people recognize this? This is the Wayback Machine, the, the Internet Archive. Um, in 1996, a supercomputer person by the name of Bruce DeKale realized that nobody was archiving the web. Okay, And being a supercomputing person, he didn't say, okay, which parts of the web shall we archive? Um, I mean, the natural librarian tr uh, approach would be you set up a selection committee. You get highly skilled people and they decide which things to collect and which things not to collect. Um, Brewster's attitude is collect the lot. Okay, Once a month, collect everything you can find on the web and keep it forever. Um, there is nothing about the Wayback Machine and the Internet Archive which is at all complicated, apart from the scale and doing it at low cost and all those sorts of things. Um, you can work out the date of this photograph by comparing my hair color to my <laughs> hair color today. But the basic idea is unchanged. Uh, you replaced hand selection with skilled people by just simple algorithms collect the lot. Um, now, compute, immense computing power with advanced algorithms. Um, the, the best example, well, Google is really the, the supreme example of this. Google came out of computer science at Stanford. They're f when they went out and hired people, they hired people with PhDs in computer science from Stanford and Berkeley and similar quality things. And the whole, whole model is based on Huge amounts of data, huge amounts of computing power, and advanced algorithms. I've got two examples here. Um, I'll skip very quickly over the first one, which, but the first one is spelling correction. Um, in the old days, when you wrote a query in a complex Boolean search language, you would put in very complex strings um, explaining whether you wanted plurals or or um, singular things, whether you wanted the British spelling or the American spelling and all that sort of stuff. With Google, you type in something badly misspelt and it gets back a, a, a message saying, did you mean this? And it's fantastically accurate. I think you'll all agree, the, the spelling correctors are fantastically accurate. The algorithm that they use, here's the basic algorithm. It's based on Bayes' theory of statistics and I've spelt it out there. But the real thing is, that the, you're asking the question, I typed a word W, okay? Did I actually mean to type a word C? What's the probability that I meant to do that? Here's the probability, and you can estimate those probabilities with surprising accuracy. 
so long as you have an enormous number of examples of, of word combinations. Google has a test um, um, set of data that anybody can download. It's, it's a trillion words, okay? And that's the sort of scale you've got to work on before these algorithms become good. But when you have that data and huge amounts of computing power, they're fantastically good. I do want to spend a bit of time on searching. Um, that's my second example. Remember, the traditional methods of searching and information retrieval um, in libraries and information in general re relied on metadata. Skilled people, skilled librarians, indexing professionals, looking at the individual items and coming up with metadata data about those items um, following um, formalized rules and things. Slow and expensive, but the only way to do it um, at the time. The net metadata was then built into indexes. The specialized computer systems used to search the indexes. Because of the complicated way this was done and the complicated search languages, you need skilled librarians in order to formulate the queries. So you developed the whole profession of medical librarians who were skilled at searching um, medlars or legal librarians who were skilled at searching the, um, the, the legal systems. Um, Jerry Salt, oh, yes, Jerry Salton, initially at Harvard, moved to Cornell about 1968, I think, um, did a whole, created a, a line of research called full text indexing based on a simple concept that the content of a document can be deduced from the words it contains. So if you have the document online, you can look at the words and and find out what the document's about, okay, automatically. And he used very simple statistical methods based on vector-based theory, and there was, I mean, not only Salton, but other people in various places around the world, um, to compare a query, okay, against um, a document. Notice this does not require a librarian to create metadata, and it doesn't require, require uh, any sort of specialist like a reference librarian to formulate a query. It's something that you or I can do. If I want to search for Villanova University, I type Villanova University and it finds um, documents that contain the words Villanova and University. But it does require two things and Sultan had neither of them and that's why he, and that's part of his genius. Um, one of the things it requires is the text has got to be online and the other is huge amounts of computer power, and he had trivial amounts. I mean, his genius was to do this research knowing that these things were going to happen. Years later, um, Sergey Brin and Larry Page at Stanford um, came up with another sort of concept. Um, and th th what they looked at was, what is the value of a document to a user? What's its importance? And their general concept was that you can predict the value of a document from its contents, the words in it, the context, whether, you know, whether documents refer to it or things like that, uh, its usage history, the, the previous things that the, the user has done and so forth. And they also use statistical methods to predict the usage. And um, the statistical methods go by the pompous name of machine learning, which I hate, but it's just, it's just statistics. And as we all know, it works remarkably well. It does require the same th two things as Salton's work, all documents in digital form. It needs even more computing power, and it needs vast amounts of data. But, but they have them, OK? So these are examples of things which were going on outside the um, libraries and publishing during the 1990s. And during that period, a gap opened up, a serious technology gap. Library computing had been in the forefront. It had been ahead of mainstream computing. And during the 1990s, it fell behind. Um, and here are some of the ways it fell behind. Out-of-date standards. Mark had been marvelous in the 60s. By the t it was not marvelous in the 90s. You know. Z39.50, Joe and I were talking about Z39.50, uh, a protocol that those of you who know about it know about it, and the rest of you I won't tell you about it. But the important thing about it was, for its time, it was great, but it was out of date by then. This overemphasis on metadata, I can't stress too much. Metadata is expensive, okay? 
And unless you can really justify its use, you sh that, that is an expense to be avoided. Um, Boolean searching, for, for some reason, libraries were very reluctant to move towards full text searching um, uh, with the, the complex search languages. And something that I don't think people talk about enough, but most library computing was done by specialist companies which were very undercapitalized and didn't have the expertise or the money to, to move rapidly. Um, as you see at the bottom here, the theme that runs through all of this is that traditional practices depended upon skilled people and that made them expensive and it made them take them a long time to do it. Um, I remember talking to uh, the developer of Lycos, the uh, early search engine, Fuzzy Molden, and as he said, he can re-index everything every day you know, for micro pennies per, per record. And Okay, finally, um, professional librarians resisted change, okay? Um, I was quoted in the um, Chronicle of Higher Education about this time as having said in public that librarians behave like a medieval guild. This was one of two times in my um, career that I have generated large amounts of hate ma mail, but I actually think it was is quite a good parallel. <coughs> Guilds having been enormously strong, effective in their way, but at the same time also by being, a bit, by being protectionist, um, preventing change and so forth. Okay, so what did libraries and librarians do? The first thing is librarianship. The library schools were clearly out of date and um, they all reacted differently. Columbia, which had a fine library school, um, took the, the path of least resistance and simply closed down their library school. Um, fortunately, other people were wiser. And I particularly um, congratulate Berkeley and Michigan for taking the lead in realizing that there was enormous opportunities here for a new type of school. And these are loosely called information schools. Um, and also other places create, have created departments. We have a small but um, really, I think, rather good information science department at, uh, at, um, at Cornell. And that's sort of things, you know, they're multidisciplinary. Computer science, statistics, economics, law, sociology. Um, these sorts of things, really important. New curriculum, new degrees, new research. In, in our information science department, we have the, you know, the best artificial intelligence people at Cornell, and the Center of Human Computer I I Interaction, and a very strong research program in social networks. Um, these sorts of programs have generated new support for research. The National Science Foundation, um, particularly when Michael Lesk was the um, divisional director there, have been very creative and generous in funding some of this research. The Institute of Museum and Library Services and we shouldn't forget the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, who, particularly their program officer, Don Waters, who have been the consistent supporters of the humanities. And new gr careers for graduates. Um, you know, one of our early Carne uh, Cornell uh, graduates is now the engineering director of Facebook, for example, um, which you may not think of Facebook as a digital library, but, or a library, but these are things are interwoven. So, so much for librarianship li and the education of the next generation. And what about libraries? Okay, a new library on an old foundation. Um, I like this picture. It's actually the Arlington Public Library. What it shows is refurbishing, okay? Not getting rid, not tearing down, but building on the old foundation. Libraries, I, th I would say that libraries are searching for a new identity, and I would say this search is continuing and it's not clear, I don't think it's clear, certainly I, I can't see what that new identity is going to be. Um, but libraries start off with some really great strengths. First of all, although I made some criticism of the blind alley that library schools have got into at, at one stage, the quality of people and the dedication of the staff is a very important asset. The buildings are a tremendous resource. Libraries, in some ways, respect 
academic traditions as much as any group at universities. In a funny way, libraries look about the university and its, and its academic traditions um, very broadly. They have a tradition of cooperation with other universities. Sometimes they, it's not as much cooperation as talking to other universities, but they, uh, they have a substantial budget and substantial endowment. And the senior faculty, in fact the faculty in general, tend to value libraries. Um, so th the theme of what's been going on, I would say in the last 15 years, is searching for new identities, searching for new ways to use these strengths. And I'm going to go quickly through some examples and then ask the question, where has this got us to? First of all, um, after being resistant to the new technology, um, libraries have embraced it quite a bit. Uh, I use my stodgy Library of Congress as an example. Here is an early website from the Library of Congress. This is a screen dump from a talk I gave in 1995, so that gives you an idea of the, of the date. An early website, even in 1995, they had significant resources online. Um, um, this community of volunteers, um, the, the, the thing that, that they can do, the Prints and Photographs Division, which at the Library of Congress has traditionally been the division that has taken the lead in technical things, um, have been putting up thousands of photographs for which they don't have detailed information on Flickr um, and saying to, to the community, tell us more about these, these photographs. So here we have um, a photograph from the Bain Historical Collection, okay? And here we have a comment from a random user. This random user is actually my wife, but that's beside the point. Um, and um, carefully researched um, information about the photograph. And so th this big collection of photographs is now building up a tremendous um, knowledge base associated with it, which the library has, has mon moderated the comments, but the, the real work has been done by communities. Next things libraries have been doing, they've been finding new, new uses for the library buildings. When I was at Dartmouth, this corridor was full of huge, great wooden uh, cabinets containing the card catalogue. Now it's used can you imagine a nicer place to study, okay? Just off the main library uh, things. I think every student in that picture has a computer. Yeah. But this is the new use for the library. And libraries are, are bringing in other parts of the, uh, of the university into their buildings. So they're running study rooms, computer laboratories, language labs, and some of the best coffee bars in universities can be found in libraries these days. And I think I go to the library at Cornell to drink coffee more than any other single reason, but at least it gets me into the building. Libraries have also been doing a lot of work as publishers, um, in particular um, coordinating the semi-published informally distributed materials of their own institutions. And the, th the buzzword there is institutional repositories. They've been exposing the digital Holdings, they have been digitizing um, materials and making them available. Um, and they have more and more got involved with collecting, preserving, and distributing research data, which is a major theme. Um, th th some of them have been involved with creating open access journals, monographs, data sets, and so forth. But generally, managing this semi-published informal um, information distribution on behalf of their universities. I think this, in the long term, I think this is a really important function that universities need. Um, here, for example, is the institutional repository as uh, uh, um, at Cornell. Most universities, uh, certainly the larger universities, have repositories like this. Um, here is a project, a very important project, by David Rosenthal and Vicky Reich at um, Stanford University for preserving um, digital data. Um, David, by the way, is an absolutely brilliant computer scientist. Um, and Vicky is a, is a traditionally tra trained librarian. They also happen to be married to each other, which leads to a good partnership. This one example, actually, about research data is not a library example. It's the um, Inter-University Consortium for Political and Social Science Research at the University of Michigan, 
which is run as a self-contained unit. Um, but it's an example of the sort of things that many uh, libraries are now doing. The next thing is we've seen a swing. It's almost a 100-year cycle, certainly a 50- year, 60-year cycle, from librarians as scholars who work with the academics to professional librarians who are rather um, separate from the academic side to librarians working with the, the, um, the uh, academics again. Digital humanities and digital scholarship, very important new fields. Here's just one example out of many. This is a Cornell example. The reason I'm showing it is because um, it's a partnership between a couple of history professors, um, uh, three librarians, with a software written by students in my software engineering course, and that's why I happen to do it. The, the, the collection is a collection of, uh, of several thousand um, newspaper articles uh, for people trying to track runaway slaves. And by, by reading this data using optical character recognition, organizing it in a structured database, they're getting all sorts of interesting um, insights into um, that period of American history. Um, I think every university can show similar examples. So the fact I use Cornell examples is just, is just personal. Mm. Um, E-science um, is um, the um, scientific equivalent, data-driven research. I think the slightly, if there is a difference between these and the digital humanities is I think more of these projects are discipline-based and inter-university based. The astronomers um, have been particular leaders in this area. Um, this is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Um, Johns Hopkins University has been particularly involved with this. But most of these projects are partnerships between the academics, in this case astronomers, and library professionals. Finally, and I think this is really important, libraries have grown to accept that it's Permitted to experiment. There used to be this feeling if a library bought out a service, they were committed to maintaining that service forever. Now there's this feeling, we'll put up a service, we'll try to make a good service, but if it doesn't catch on, we'll modify it or even take it down. And I think that experiment, for example, this is something on the semantic web. I am not a fan of the semantic web, but I am an enthusiast for, the, for people experimenting with it, and if they prove me wrong, fantastic, okay? So th this is some, some examples of how libraries have been searching for identity and some of the good things going on. I now want very quickly to um, talk about academic libraries today. Okay? Um, this is another Dartmouth picture. I love this picture. It's the English library at Dartmouth. When I was at Dartmouth, I used to go there at 4 o'clock in the afternoon because it was the only place on campus you could get a really good cup of tea. Okay? They, I hope they still serve tea in a large, ornate um, urn and that sort of stuff. Here you have, in the middle, you have two people, presumably students, sitting down at a table with books and papers in front of them. Okay? But look at this character over in the corner. Okay? Over here. Uh, he's sitting there with his computer on his lap. He looks totally at home. Okay? The library is his place of work. He's as much at home in this library as this fellow here with this paper and pencil and things like that. And I think that's really important. So what are libraries doing today? First of all, we mustn't forget the traditional role, okay? The traditional collections, the books, the older materials are really, really important in some disciplines. I couldn't resist the temptation to bring another example from, from my Oxford College this is a um, 13th century uh, Boethius's um, theory of music. For any of you who ever get complaints that textbooks are out of date, this was written sometime around the 6th century and was a, a, a set book at Oxford well into the 19th century. Uh, but Oxford is traditionally the home of lost causes. Okay? Um, so humanities and some social sciences, the traditional library is just as important as it ever was. Um, and most disciplines have an historical aspect to them for which the traditional collections are really important. In fact, it's interesting that every library, big or small, that I've ever been in, you know, just a little village library, will have its own 
special collection. It may be quite small, but those special collections are very important. On the other hand, having stressed the importance of the tra traditional libraries, it has to be said that in many disciplines, my own discipline is one of them, the traditional library is essentially not part of our academic world. Okay? Um, the, and in fact, at Cornell, the Engineering and Computer Science Library has n now consolidated all its collections um, into the historic part of it. Um, and then law and other professions, law is a good example. The working um, um, law, lawyer, law, law scholar has everything online. From time to time you see discussions about do law schools need libraries? And I honestly believe the answer is that they don't need traditional libraries, although the American Bar Association refuses to give accreditation to a law school that doesn't have a traditional library. Um, and there are lots of disciplines that are hybrids, okay? Partly um, they use the traditional, partly they use the new. Um, everybody, whether they're humanities people or um, whatever, make use of a lot of these non-traditional services. Um, I, know, I, I put Amazon there with a tongue in the cheek. Quite a lot of my early work was involved with interlibrary lending. Um, nowadays, if I want something that's not easily available from the library, I just buy it, okay? from Barnes & Noble or Amazon. It, that's my replacement for, for interlibrary lending. Open access collections and discipline resources, okay? An interesting observation, and this worries me a lot, is in general the disciplines that need the traditional library least are the rich disciplines. Law and medicine, physical sciences, engineering and so forth. It worries me that the people who need the traditional library most tend to be the less well-funded disciplines, which in many universities have less power in the budget process. And if I get concerned about the, the future of libraries, it's because I'm concerned about budgets. Um, you know, I had an interesting discussion last night over dinner with the Dean of Arts and Sciences here about how decision, budgeting decisions are made at Villanova, and I won't comment about Villanova. Um, having been on budget committees at several universities, for, in fact, for, I sat on budget committees for 17 years, my basic belief is that a small number of people, typically pro provost, dean, financial vice president, president, make the fundamental budget decisions, but they respond to pressures, and they respond to pressures from the departments, from the academic disciplines, and so forth. In the past, there was an overwhelming consensus that the library mattered and the library budget had to be protected. I worry that in the future, and universities are under tremendous financial pressures, the leaders of the different disciplines may say, we don't really need to fund the library quite as much. Um, and that worries me a lot. Okay. Um, however, there are reasons for hope. And here are some of them. Um, Libraries represent the liberal arts tradition in, in, in universities, and that's why I'm really glad this is a Phi Beta Kappa talk, because Phi Beta Kappa represents the liberal arts tradition. There is enormous support for libraries in academia, often from quite unexpected sources. Donors have always been very willing, and society in general supports libraries. In going through this talk, I've been noting, I happen, every, everybody I've mentioned by name, apart from the three 19th century librarians and Sergi Brin at, um, at um, Stanford. Everybody else is somebody I've known quite well during their career, okay? And I think it's fair to say that without exception, although those people, all of them technologists, all of them, um, you know, most, many, most of them computer scientists and so forth, but they've all been enthusiasts about, about libraries. Joe and I were talking last night about Bruce DeKale, who is one of my heroes. Okay, he is a thoroughgoing computer science nerd, okay? Uh, he done brilliant work in supercomputing, but he likes to call himself a librarian. For a long time, the library community rejected him. Nowadays, I think the librarians welcome him with arms as, as one of them. And an awful lot of people, and I think the people who value education and scholarship as liberal arts, are the people who are most supportive about libraries. And that's why 
on my optimistic days, and not every day is an optimistic day, but on most days, I think Middlebury probably made a very good and, and decision to build this new building right in the centre of their campus and to use their scarce resources for um, creating a new library. So that's the end of my talk. Um, I believe Joe is now going to make some comments and then we'll have a discussion. Thank you. That was really provocative and useful and actually nothing in it surprised me and there's not a lot to disagree with. Um, oh, I'm really disappointed. But I'm gonna, no, I'm going to say a few things because I'm, it's, it's, I'm in a funny moment here because many of my former colleagues know a lot about how I think about libraries and how I think about the future. But um, I'm going to try and maybe add some things to um, the concepts I used to share here. Um, because my thinking continues to evolve and grow and be informed by um, experiences as my career um, evolves, uh, you know, in a new institution. And um, th though there's not a lot to take issue with in terms of the, um, the arc of historical development that Bill described, I think there are actually some different perspectives on things going on quietly in the world of libraries that ultimately might point to a different trajectory and a different um, uh, concluding point. I'll, I'll say this, that I have gone through, and everyone I know professionally who's been involved in libraries, um, I've gone through waves of tremendous optimism and waves of tremendous anxiety about the future because it's not clear um, where we're going to land. And I think one of your opening comments expressed that. Um, increasingly, though, I have a hunch that there is a profound durability to the social institution of the library that is independent of physical media. And, I, and, I and yet I believe that physical collections continue to matter. And I, I've come to this conclusion um, partly through a year and a half of work with internationally prominent architects who have built some of the most interesting new library buildings in the world in the last decade. And um, one of the things we've talked about a lot is what were libraries in the classical world? And you go back and look at the architecture of the original classical world library complexes and you see that they had repositories that held stuff but the repositories were situated around a courtyard with a temple on one side and they were social gathering places for interaction in the formation of intellectual and creative communities and I would argue that um, however libraries carry out their mission in the evolving information environment, um, there is a profound human hunger for community construction. And it's not just virtual community construction. It's community construction in face-to-face -face settings. Now, like metadata, face-to-face -face settings are very expensive. But I, I would argue that to the degree that libraries as physical enterprises are in peril, universities themselves as physical communities are in peril. So to me, the library is in some ways a canary in the coal mine because if we believe it's worth the cost of face-to-face -face community in various forms, then we will continue to figure out how to make the investments in those goods that s to s serve to, s to nurture, sustain, um, and enhance our sense of, of connectedness to each other in the various domains where we work. One of the reasons the image of the Dartmouth reading room with the kid with the computer and the other pair of, of students at the table with the books is interesting is because I actually think, and you can look at this in terms of architectural history, that libraries as spaces um, have fulfilled 
in many settings, an aspirational purpose. They held stuff, yes, but they also were, you know, almost sacred spaces that people entered, and in entering them, they developed a sense of connection to what the library stood for. The intellectual enterprise embodied by the content on the shelves and expressed by the members of the community in their interactions in those spaces. So I think that remains a profoundly powerful center of gravity that we have maybe a limited period of time to leverage. I, I do think we have a, a time challenge around how we redefine our mission so that we remain powerful presences. So that's one piece of it. Another piece of it that I think is really important, it's maybe implicit in some of the things that Bill said, but which I've devoted a huge amount of time to thinking about in um, working on the design for a new building is what's the center of gravity in physical in that physical space when it's no longer collections per se? And you know, I'm going to use a glib phrase that I actually believe is quite relevant and quite powerful. I think in an intellectual community where there are students and faculty together or, together across the disciplines that a library is an idea factory. And what its role is, is to bring disparate people in contact with each other for conversation. And that, that, and that this moment where we're seeing a move towards things like library um, publishing, the return of expertise to the library space, the um, interaction of people across various disciplines with new kinds of tools to do new kinds of research, represents itself um, part of a trajectory away from a collecting mission and towards a production mission. And I think the place of the library in the, in the 21st century university is increasingly going to be about um, a continuum of activity from inquiry and discovery through expression to creation and promulgation. And so in, in my world now, the university press is part of my portfolio. And we're bringing the press into the library and we're thinking of its formal publishing enterprise as being sustained, but a whole range of other enterprises being connected to it. And I think um, what I'm seeing is even in these disciplines that are not using the physical library, um, and I'll give you a specific example, when I call people together to have a conversation about, for instance, a new opportunity to build the data visualization room, the people from the sciences are at the table and they're telling me they want to be there. And they want to be engaged in using that tool in teaching and research. And they don't want it just in their department. So I think there is the sense that if we leverage um, those kinds of opportunities and bring in the right kind of experts and greatly expand the definition of what a library professional is, um, we have a huge opportunity to continue to be at the center of academic life. So and 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 also sustain it, our, the value of our traditional mission. Because I need to tell you that um, you know, a part of our design process at Temple has involved an awful lot of focus grouping and engaging with various constituents. And we still hear from our 18 to 22 year old students, don't get rid of the books. Now we're going to greatly compress how we store books and we're going to only have about 10 percent of our collection on open browsing shelves. But at the top level of our new building, there are 200,000 books and a long continuous run of stacks, and that's deliberately in place there to create that sense of the massiveness of the physical record that is inspiring, that people want contact with, even if they're not using books as their primary means of accessing information. So I, th I think, in short, there's two things we have to do to, um, to guarantee a strong future for libraries. One is to leverage the symbolic power of our traditions in creative ways. Actually, there's maybe three things that we need to do. So there's that. There's thinking about shifting the center of gravity from repository functions to active, creative, scholarly, uh, and productive functions. And then we need to, the third thing is that we need to be very coherent and articulate about telling this story so people understand where we're going and why we're going there. Because um, when people hear this story, they get very excited about what the new library can be. Um, so that's kind of my frame around it. There are another, there's another cluster of issues that I think is worth talking about. Um, 
regarding social function, and, and this is where you'll be familiar with some of m my thinking about this, which is that all of these enterprises, Google and Facebook, are corporate entities with very short histories. They don't have a commitment to historical duration, and they don't have an intrinsic commitment to the public good. Now, the concept of the public good is continuously under fire in our social and economic world. But the library as an enterprise needs to stand on a foundation of the public interest over the long haul and what I've often called the intellectual commons. Keeping the commons open, defining the commons, and making sure that it has um, a protected interest. And I do think that things that are going on in the broad community of libraries um, represents an implicit commitment to that. Hadi Trust is one example. Um, this emerging national um, digital preservation network, Deepin, I think is a really interesting enterprise that shows um, so a lot of creative energy and investment around how are we going to make the digital record durable across cultural and memory organizations. Another thing I think is profoundly important, it's kind of a butterfly effect, but I'm starting to see it really get some legs, even though it's small, is the Digital Public Library of America. Um, there's interesting things going on with the thinking about technology infrastructure there, um, the commitment to society, I think some very powerful tools built around work that's come from the university library community, like um, the extension of the Fedora repository model using um, a new protocol, or not so new now, but uh, called Hydra to build services on top of that collectively that begin to leverage the collective capacity of our technical community to do some very interesting things. So I'm actually quite optimistic about the potential for li libraries to, to, to do new things again with technology in these spaces that are emerging as long as we can protect the basic economic underpinnings that allow us to have the flexibility to do that. Um, because I, I think one of the interest, interesting things about the DPLA is this very molecular architecture, very lightweight central organization, distributing engagement out into the community and creating a context for, for collective action that does not require large-scale heavyweight in investment in any one place. I do think where we failed in general is that we have not, we've spoken a lot about it, but we have not engaged in rich, broad collective action in the library community. And I think we need to be a lot more intentional and engaged in doing things together. Because I don't think the future can be about the Villanova Library versus the Temple Library versus the Penn Library. We need to think collectively about our collections, collectively about our technology, and even collectively about our expertise. Um, and, and, you know, tr treat our community uh, broadly across the domain of libraries as the key asset we can leverage. Because, because places like Google, for instance, have huge resource pools and talent pools. None of us are going to have those in our individual environments. But when we bring those things together across the environment, there's actually a lot of talent and a lot of energy, and, and we need to figure out how to make that work um, towards common goals rather than always be in our local environments inventing things um, on their own on a one-off basis. So those are my quick thoughts. Um, uh, I don't know to what degree they, they allay the anxieties about the future, but I, I'm actually in a, in a moment of, of very guarded, um, always guarded, but n real optimism about what's what's possible. And maybe that's partly because I'm involved now in a building project and I see an institution really invested in the possibilities that building represents. Because, you know, you always get this question, well, why are you building, you know, what amounts to a $200 million um, structure? And it's because we think that there's a future need that's very real, but that's very different. And the spaces are different. Um, the way we were thinking about staffing that building, the functions that are in the building are different, but they're still recognizably library functions. So, any questions for either one of us or for us to? I, I just want, um, as you talked about the social function, um, the, the Middlebury Library is a library that's set in a idyllic 
circumstance. Joe's library is in a very different circumstance, and I think there's one dimension of that that connects us to the civic enterprise of the entire nation, of the, the comedy. It, it connects us to public education, opportunity for young kids whose means are not, um, not, not abundant. And it's an, it's an interesting aspect of how your university and the library use its mission that might deserve a, a passing. Comment. Okay, I'll, I'll say a few words about that because there is, I do think, um, a sense of, so I, uh, Temple is, as we say, Philadelphia's public university. And we are situated geographically in a um, not entirely, but still significantly distressed region of the city, with um, you know a fairly large indigent population, um, a school district that is completely dysfunctional, um, and a lot of people who need a lot of things. Um, that many people in my community uh, around Temple don't have computers. Um, many of them don't have skills to use computers so that if they need to apply for a job through an online application, someone needs to help them do it. And this gets to this sense of, you know, and I was actually writing a thing about this on my way out on the train. One of the challenges for libraries and maybe for universities is we tend to be very idealistic places in a world where idealism gets very little purchase because we've reduced everything to um, a denominator about marketplace values. If people don't want to pay for it as, in a in an, um, kind of a volitional transaction, then it's not worth anything. And we're so we're a kind of countercultural in that way. But I think te Temple. One of the exciting things about being at Temple is that there is a commitment to the city that comes from our president and it comes from the culture of the institution. And there's a commitment to service. And so. The library is a place, even though we're a university, where we welcome that community in. We provide public access to computers, we provide com computer skill training, and we provide assistance working with our HR department for job seeking. And no one else is going to do that. And I believe that that's a social mission that is, you know, um, li libraries are not social service agencies. But we're engaged right now in a conversation with the free library about their neighborhoods program and ways in which we can be partners in the city. The College of Education at Temple is making a very large commitment to the city school system. So I think in a broad sense, there's this notion that institutions like libraries can do social good in particular ways. And partly they do that by leveraging the loyalty and the sense of purpose that the people ascribe to them. Um, but it's hard. It's hard work because it's hard to get that money. I mean, you know, I, I, reading these stories about what's going on in, you know, uh, Wisconsin, North Carolina, and today Ohio, about these great, great public university systems that under are truly under assault financially. What are we going to do about, you know? a value system that lets governors get away with that and says it's OK. You know, I mean, University of Wisconsin is one of the great public universities. And I'm saying this kind of passionately because I'm worried about a society that continually says we're not going to invest in education. And the story has become about tuition being too high instead of being about the fact that the state and federal governments are no longer putting appropriate levels of resources into those enterprises, and that's why tuition is high. And it, it's a crazy situation. And so all of us, in some ways, are under assault. You know, in New Jersey, they did a really interesting thing with public libraries. Governor Christie, bless his heart, decided that if you have a library that's funded, when you get your tax bill, the cost of the library has to be separately itemized on the tax bill. And it's clearly intended to make people question the value of libraries in their communities. 
because they're not putting a price on the fire department or the police department or water services or sanitation services. So I think one of our challenges is the very construct of public good is under unrelenting political assault. And that's the big threat to what we do. It's not digital technology. And discernment. <laughs> Other questions? Comments? I have a question in terms of diversity. Sure. Because uh, I've noticed I've been in this country for a long time. I've noticed a lot of minority uh, citizens or residents, they cannot speak English very well. They don't know uh, computer skills very well. They don't, they don't, some of them are very poor and cannot afford school and computers. And how can library, in terms of academic libraries and public libraries, to help those um, <laughs> underrepresented and undereducated minority residents? So, boy, that's a hard question. Um, I'm not sure what it has to do with the future of academic libraries, but it's really important in terms of mission. I, I, um, I don't know if you know about the $25 million grant that the Free Library of Philadelphia recently got from the William Penn Foundation. One of the targets of that funding is to help the Free Library deliver things like liter literacy services and educational assistance, tutoring services and other things in the neighborhoods of the city. And to think differently about what the library's role is in the community. Now things like that make me optimistic because here's a big foundation that said, okay, we're going to step in because the city's not doing it. But, you know, that gets to this issue of, you know, what are, what are the institutions that can make those commitments? And libraries are one of them. And so we have a job in, you know, on my side of the line to fight for that mission tooth and nail and to recognize that those communities, no one else is going to reach out to them if we don't. So, I mean, that's, I, I agree that's, that's an important thing for us to do. It's hard to do it, I mean, because, you know, again, in, in my setting, I'm supposed to be primarily serving a university community. People are paying tuition, people are, are paid to do research, but we also are trying to serve a local community who aren't paying our bills, and it's a really interesting, divided mission. Anyway. I just, just one comment for Bill. I love that <coughs> picture, and the, the reason, maybe it's just totally obvious, but every pathway to every place on the campus <coughs> goes into there and it, it just puts the library in its place as the center, the collecting place, the place where all the various different interests and in disciplines, they all meet and it comes together and, and the picture is brilliant and I hope you'll have a picture like well, that. We are, we're putting a new quad in, right, at Temple that the library sits at the head of and the idea is to create a center of campus yeah. and I, a phrase I like to use is the library is a connection engine, yeah. it needs to be a connection it, engine. Can I, um, first of all, respond to Joe? I think your comments about the role of universities and libraries within universities, uh, have the social role and the community role, I think is really very, very interesting and very important and very profound. And this, as um, was pointed out, is an expensive building, but even more expensive is to take the prime location in your campus and decide what building you're going to put there. And it's the, the decision that this is going to be a, a sort of the social academic um, center of the, uh, of the college um, seems to be very, very, very important. By the way, I thought all your comments were really interesting. I've been much too privileged in the universities I've been at. I've been at places like Dartmouth and Cornell, which are rural places which might as well be surrounded by an ocean from the amount of community contact. And I sometimes forget just how important places like Temple are um, and that you, you're helping the community role.
graduated last year from the University of Rochester, and they're going through a process of trying to figure out the future role of their library. Mm -hmm. So what they did was they did a series of forums throughout my senior year uh, where they asked a student, I was on the committee, to re redesign the library architecture in collaboration with the architects. And what it became pretty clear pretty quickly was while students agreed that there should be, like, special collections and archives should stay, there was less importance on retaining physical collections of traditional books and more on creating areas for knowledge production, um, new laboratories, new bus a business mm. incubator, I think. Now, these things are going to be phased in over 15 years because the money's not all there readily. But the, it's been very interesting to see how the plans are going over. I've been of the opinion that, as a history major, it's better to be in the conversation and shaping how this is preserved. But it's been interesting to see some of the faculty at my undergrad, they're just getting hung up on the on keeping books and the quantity of books. And I, I say, yes, it is important that we have the books, but if you're just focusing on that, you're missing the point of keeping the entire institution relevant. And to do that, it's gonna to have to be a knowledge factory and not just a warehouse. I'll comment on that comment. For a long time, university rankings, the library holdings, that number was a very important if you had a million plus books mm. or periodicals or access, that was part of the equation. And they've been slowly changing some of that. So that's why a lot of universities mm. have put reticence to, to do that. I was, when I was leaving at Ohio State, they shut down, and that's a big library, and it was important. They shut down the library, and they had several throughout campus, shut down the main library at, at a school of 55,000 for a year and a half to repurpose the library. And they brought it back and they actually bulldozed and took out the addition sections and brought it back to this early 1900s kind of gold and became mm -hmm. that knowledge factory area. They built in more spaces. It was, they got rid of most of the stacks that no one was upset about and mm -hmm. find people in there. But then the, the usage was just tripled by the number of students all in a short period of time, but it was a significant investment of money. But that library sits right on the oval, which overlooks the entire campus and everything that leads through Ohio State's library system there. So it's a tremendous amount of, uh, of effort and, and changing of how the library is focused on campus. Can I make a couple of comments? Um, first of all, I mentioned that the Engineering and Computer Science Library at Cornell had withdrawn all its collections, but they have not closed down the library. See. The library's social role, the, the role as a, a space for people um, study, work together, things, continues. And uh, this is, seems to be a logical extension of this sort of thing. The second thing is your comment about people ranking universities by the number of books in their library. And this is why I say last night, sometimes I get frustrated by librarians. I am a great fan of our university librarian, Anne Kenny at Cornell. But if you go on the website for the, li the libraries, each of the, the branch libraries has a page with a summary description and you go to, say, the music library. It says the music library has so many books, so many s things like that. If you go to the engineering and computer science library, it says the collections are online. <laughs> Which is where almost apologizing for not having a large number they can put up there of, say, what out-of-date materials they have. <laughs> and I, anyway, that's the, that's the point you're making. And I, have, I don't want to go on with my hobby horses. <laughs> yes? I don't know if everybody heard that comment, but it was fundamentally 
pushing back on me uh, uh, and, and my but, um, observations that many uh, things we think of as intellectual processes can be done by um, algorithms, artificial intelligence, and so forth. Um, I believe strongly that many of the things can be done. And I also believe strongly that we're in a period of transition and we haven't, reckon, we haven't reckoned, recognized yet which things will end up being well done by technology. And searching and information retrieval is, to me, an obvious example. Um, I believe that we naturally have a lag, that we uh, always overemphasize the importance and value of our human um, things, and only over time grow to recognize that there are sometimes alternative ways to do it. But I don't know what that trade-off is, and I don't know where that trade-off is going to end, and I'm certainly am not going to claim um, that um, the social, human, um, instinctive things are going to be totally displaced. What I do think is we should not use our expensive um, people on the tasks that we, that we can do better with technology. So I'm, I'm pushing back on you, but I am also agreeing with you, if you still have it. Falls to me to say some thank yous here at the end. Um, one thing I will mention in these final comments about this uh, sort of center of campus thing is that one of many quotes I, I admire in uh, the faith with which this institution is uh, historically connected is the line, where where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And I think the flip of that is if your heart is in this, then that's where you should put some of your treasure. It's expensive to do buildings like that. It's expensive to do that where they're doing them. But whether, as, as Joe mentioned, uh, the library is the, the miner's canary, or as we are getting a <laughs> feeling from, from Bill, is the microcosm of the way the university heads into the future. Um, both libraries and universities are in this sort of state, state of balance, which, uh, or transition, like I'm hearing now, um, between this place where you store things and the place where you interact with people. And, and instead of what your website says of how many things you have, it maybe should say how many things you do what comes out of this interaction. And I think that's a really valuable place for libraries. Whatever that value, it's my place to, to thank people who've contributed either money or time value to this happening today. Uh, departments of Computing Sciences, Departments of uh, Department of Mathematics and Statistics, uh, the Office of the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, the Office of the Vice President for Academic Affairs, uh, the staff of the library uh, have put, to, put lots of either time or energy or money or all of the above into making these things happen. So I thank all, all of you for that. Um, See, I should write some of these comments down that I wanted to say. Uh, and above all, of course, I, I thank the National Phi Beta Kappa folks for this visiting scholars program that brings someone like this to campus, and especially for, for Joe and helping us out, but also Bill Arms for his, for his uh, remarkable insights that we hope to, to, to take away. And we are in this time of transition. We are in this time of continuing equilibrium. There's, there's a central location where you pull people in. There's the, the dissemination in the community that, that, that reaches out. And that balance is always changing. One little phrase as a mathematician that I noticed that, that Joe mentioned was a butterfly effect, that if you're not familiar with chaos theory, that's a small change in input can make for a large change in output. I think it's the way that's the way libraries work in the university community, and I think that's what we try to inspire our students to do as they go out into the world, that one little change uh, in input can make for a big change in the output. And I think all of these changes of finding that equilibrium between the, the pull in and the reach out uh, doing things the old way, doing things the new way. Uh, it's that ongoing balance in the face of change, that finding that equilibrium that, that is the challenge um, that's before us. Um, oh, there's one more thing. I'm, I'm saying you give an academic a microphone and he talks for a few extra minutes. <laughs> I, I apologize. Um, oh, uh, finally, uh, it's appropriate that we have this here and today because the speaker's corner, I think, illustrates one of those new things that happens in libraries. And I would like to reiterate that that is not to bring people in to speak at you, but to speak with each other. Just a couple of weeks ago, I was in here for a presentation of several faculty and a room full of students to talk about Je suis Charlie. I mean, that's now, that's happening. That's really important stuff. And the people are engaged and discussing from very academic intellectual perspectives, from very gut reactions of the personal experience of the students, and from their, their reading of media and seeing what comes at them in the culture. Libraries are still places where that, that interaction sort of stuff happens. So come back to the speaker's corner to speak not at or get spoken at, but to speak with each other. 
It's also fitting that this happens today on a day when the announcement of uh, the new director of libraries at, at uh, Villanova uh, came out over email, I guess in my office before I came. Um, oh, rats. Uh, Millicent Gaskell has, has just been named to will take over at the end of the year. To from be the MIT. New, from MIT, right. Um, I don't know if many of you saw her presentation when she was on campus. Very exciting. Looks like it's going to be a good thing for the, for the library. So it's nice to be in the speaker's corner, which sort of encapsulates the way libraries are working now and on a day when some of the future of Villanova Library has been announced to the public. Thanks again to all of you for coming. Thanks to Professor Arms and to Joe for helping us out. Stick around for some refreshments.